Those are good cobs. Yep, those are good. Those are good. Okay, Eric, I'm going to start today with, uh, I know you, you mentioned before that um, we did start a podcast and I asked a question. Yeah. And you said, I like the thought-provoking thing. It, you threw me off and made yeah, me think. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it, was it made you think live, it. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I, this, is, this is thought-provoking, but it's not going to shock you because I've given you this poem and I'm going to explain it. So I'm going to start this podcast off with my glasses. All right, nice. there we go. So when I was playing uh, junior for Hamilton, Coach Bill LaForge was our coach. He was crazy, been kicked out of the league a couple of times, kicked out of the NHL, nuts. But I actually liked him. Most guys didn't like him, but he was. But what I liked about him is he was honest. And uh, I think he was honest anyways. I'm not 100% sure, but he seemed like he was honest. And what I mean by that, he would tell you the truth, in my opinion. So if I wasn't playing good, he would just flat out say, this is why. So I, I liked him that way, And but he was crazy. I mean, crazy. He used Do to I take, know this guy? He's dead now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's not, we're not laughing because he's dead. <laughs> not he's but, dead but, he, but there's sorry. articles about him all over it, yeah, all yeah. over the place. In fact, his son Bill, he he spelt. <laughs> this is how crazy he is. <laughs> no, the stories are great. So his his son Bill is. I think he's a uh, scouts in the Western League or something like that. Okay. Now. But his, and he was like. Uh, so I would have been 17 at the time, and his son Bill was probably let's say eight nine, but he spelled his name B I L. Single L because he didn't. He's got to earn the next L. <laughs> <laughs> this is the mindset of this guy. Yeah, I mean, our trainer used to be come out in the middle of practice and have some pills for him and put him right on the right on the dash or, or on the boards. Yeah. Say, hey, coach, come over here and he pop his pills and like I I I, I could tell stories. I'm not going to do that because I. Uh, that's not why we're here. You know, that's, that's for spitting chicklets <laughs> yeah. and stuff. There's other guys who could do that, but it was it was nuts. And there's stories that are so unbelievable. When we tell stories, unless I have another Steelhawk with me or guys that have played in the leagues, is, are those true? And and uh, the people would never believe what, the yeah. stuff that went on. Yeah. But the the thing that he did very well is uh, he had a lot of motivating things. Now, some guys don't get motivated by this stuff, but I was. Uh, I, I was. And uh, so we had this thing that we had to memorize. It's a bookmark. And it's a bookmark for it's people a, It's listening. a bookmark, but yeah, it's a bookmark. So he would... Um, at the beginning of the of training camp, he gave everybody with the Steelhawk logo on it, and he said, memorize it. So I would go home and try to memorize it, because at any point, he would come in randomly. Packer, what's, what's uh, say the poem? So you'd say, and if you didn't say it, like, he'd lose respect for you. Yep. So you had to say it in front of your 20, 23 guys. So anyways, this is it, and it's actually very, very deep. So... I'm going to read it to you the best I can. And I do, I have memorized it. So I want to, I don't want to look like I don't know this, but I, I don't want to fumble. So that's why I'm going to read it. So it's, it's about mindset. So if you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but think that you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you'll, you've lost. For out of the world, we find success starts with the fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. If you th you've got to think high to rise, you've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. And this is the part, this is the one I love. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. I love it. Yeah, that's and it funny. was, a, it was appropriate for me because this is a little background story. I've always been reluctant to talk about this. Um, a lot of people say like, who were one of the reasons that you didn't make the NHL or whatever? And when I say that I was a mental midget, I was a mental midget. Um, and what I mean by that is growing up playing hockey, you know, I was thinking about it the other day. Um, so a lot of the kids, like, I had to grow up really fast because my dad, my dad, uh, went out for ice cream and he never came back. So I had to deal with that. And then, um, my mother did the best that she could and she had a little part-time job. Well, no, she had a full-time job making very, very little money. And uh, on the side, she would sew at the shop that she worked at. She would do some sewing on the side to make an extra five bucks, ten bucks here and there. So as when I was when I was playing in junior, uh, when I would make money, I'd have to. Not, didn't, yeah, I guess I had to, but I would help my mom pay rent, buy groceries and stuff like that. So a lot of the money had to go to that. So when I so when I say uh, so, my focus was kind of all over the place. You know, I was thinking about home a lot. Uh, my dad put us in a really bad atmosphere and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of mental struggles not like I was mentally ill but mental struggles meaning believe believing in myself 
And I never really understood it there at that time because I was going through. But as I reflect back, I'm like, wow, that that was that's hard when you're when you're trying to r- make a goal, a run for a goal, and you have adult stuff that you have to take care of right so even even to this day i struggle with do i deserve to be successful so when when this something like this stuff would come out i would grab onto that and i try to really grasp it and it was like the mental game that i really wanted to understand because like it's like i said especially now i still go go into times where i go okay uh, i could do this but like do i deserve it because i grew up with without a lot of things so this kind of stuff really strengthened me. And when I say I, when I had to build myself up, when I didn't play hockey for, for years, um, this kind of stuff has got, is what got me through it. So believing in yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. So. I think, uh, it's really hard to, especially growing up, but even as adults, even now, me now, you now, we've talked about this kind of topic a bit before is that it's hard to understand your own mentality it's hard to understand your own motivations it's hard to understand what you really think about things and something like that like i remember you printed a box of those those bookmarks with that poem on it just again so everyone listening it's a it's a bookmark with the poem printed on the bookmark and you had a box of it and i have about 50 of those at home yeah and i have one in every book yeah that i have on my bookshelf until i ran out of the bookmarks yeah um and it's just, it's one of those things that can act like an anchor, right? Like every time you hear it, every time you see it, every time uh, you feel it, you end up reconnecting with that part of your brain that maybe does think you can do it or is willing to be motivated or, or just needs a little bit of a push yeah. in the right direction or whatever. Yeah. So that's something, and it doesn't have to be that, but that's just one example of, of that idea of having an anchor, something that you can, you can use as a trigger for yourself to keep yourself, you know, motivated on the right path, getting you back to it, whatever, whatever it is. Right. So that's, I really like that too. I remember when you, when you brought those to the gym for the first time, it's nice. Yeah. It's uh little things like that go a long way, mm-hmm. you know, Big and time. it was good because, and, 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 and our topic, what we're going to focus on a lot today is called preparedness, preparedness. It's a weird word, Prepar- but it's being ed. prepared. Yeah. And, um, coach made sure that we were prepared. Like if you didn't have this memorized, you're in the doghouse, and, uh, it kept you sharp. So like, you know, it's a little thing, probably, I don't even know if he was thinking this, but I, as I look back now, maybe it was a test to just see if you cared, <laughs> if you actually t- took the time to do this, because at the end of the day, this doesn't make you a good hockey player. No, but it makes you, it, it, it could bring your back, like, like that anchor you said, it could bring you back to, okay, right. get focused again. Yeah, re- re- you might have sure. to say this. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, the thing that just popped into my head when, when you're saying that is like you just said, that's not going to make you a good hockey player and and who knows what the actual motivation behind your coach telling you that was it could have just been let's see if the boys do it right yeah. something is yeah. as, as easy as that just something little let's yeah. see if they'll do it let's see if they'll how do they react know it. to it how do they react to it right and something that just popped in my head while you were saying that so yesterday i had a guy come in he's doing our, our workouts mm-hmm. and we have to wear the masks right now when yeah, we're in the gym I was there right yep. and this kid and he has he has a brother the brother always brings a mask and he always forgets his mask right and this is so little and dumb but it's so true though every time this kid walks in for the last the last two weeks and then even before when we had to wear masks before the lockdown yeah he'd forget and i would say listen man bring the mask like i don't understand i don't understand why you don't have it with you right your brother has it with you you guys come from the same house why don't you have it yeah and he's just i don't know just a careless like and so now i actually think for him that he's unreliable and he forgets things. Yeah. I actually think that yeah. because and you told him that. And I told him that. I actually think that you're unreliable. If I need something from you or your brother or your group that's working yeah. out, I will not ask you. I will ask somebody else because you don't bring your mask. Yeah. And how dumb is that? Right? Like that is just a stupid thing. Yeah. You it's so just remember the mask. Check yeah. in and remember the mask. Yeah. Right? Bring it. Now I don't think that about you. Right? Yeah. And that's just one stupid little thing. He's coming in you're, you're not prepared. That's yeah. one of those things like you're yeah. not prepared now. Right. And so what, what, the, if you need a reminder, set the reminder, whether it's, whether it's about a stupid mask or whether it's an anchor to get yourself back on track with what you're doing, right. Mm-hmm. Have something that's going to check you back into what you're doing so that you're ready to go for whatever it is, whether it's something little and stupid, or if it's something that's, that's more significant. And I, I, uh, I was reading, I'm reading a book right now. It's called, uh, what's it called? How to lead when you're not in charge. 
Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. And it's okay book. Doesn't sound very interesting. It's it's an oh it's an okay book actually. Yeah. It's, not it's great. Not great. It's uh, the it's, title gets you. The title's good. Yeah. It's written by uh, I think he's a pastor or something. Okay. So there's like a very religious yeah. um, influence on it. Yeah talks a lot about God and stuff and I'm not yeah. particularly religious so that doesn't resonate with me a lot but there's yeah. a lot of good things he says right and he quoted the Bible I forget what what chapter it was from the Bible but it was uh, he I think it, it goes some something along the lines of this he who, who can be trusted with little yeah can be trusted with much yep right yeah and that's another one of those things it's like to whom much is given much is expected yeah, right just so something along those lines it's yeah. the same kind the same kind of principle right yeah. and so you know, it's just a good lesson. Like you take those things, be prepared, whether you need an anchor to do it, need to set a reminder to do it and just be the guy that's ready to go. Right. Well, that's why I love, like when I started uh, studying the military, uh, because I did some leadership stuff and I love the principles of it. That's one of the things that I loved about it. I, as a kid, I could never understand like, why are these guys like yelling at them all the time? And like, you, you have to have your shoes shine to like, if they found a speck, they'd find a reason to to hammer you with that or if they if your bed wasn't made perfect and you weren't up at this time and it's like so disciplined but as i started studying i'm like okay that makes sense (laughs) like because you because if you if you just get in the habits of being prepared for battle at any moment because that's actually what happens like the the, because what happens in war i'm sure i'm not really uh shocking anybody with this but maybe you've never thought about this uh in war you don't say you know like whoever whoever whatever country you're fighting they don't phone or give you a text and say okay we're going to be coming uh at four in the morning over the mountain uh and give you time to prepare it's the game's on so you could be in a cold sleep you you do sleep cold yeah cold sleep and uh (laughs) all of a sudden you got to be ready to go so if you didn't fold your gear and have your gear ready to go fold your clothes ready to go at that instant moment be ready within three seconds could be game over well it goes to that that saying how you do anything is how you do everything yes and that is what is underneath all that right it's like you get up and make your bed precisely as you're being told yeah so that when something happens in the moment you'll get up and it'll be a reaction rather than a decision right you get up and you go yeah and you already have it on autopilot you know what to do you know how to execute yeah and those little something as stupid as make your bed and make it the right way and make it presentable so if somebody walks in your bedroom they go oh wow that's a well-made bed yeah. like something that seems like it doesn't matter yeah. those small little things that you do daily they bleed yeah. into your other stuff yeah right yeah so that's that's a, a really good principle yeah. of that too that well the, the with george st pierre book uh the how it starts off it starts off with him describing not he not describing just saying i walk into my apartment in montreal and i i put my gloves on the heater and he goes through the process of when he comes home what he does and how he gets prepared for the next day so that he can get up out of bed and it's rinse and repeat so he Mm -hmm. gets up and his gym bag's already ready so there's no no pissing around his clothes are ready and he gets up grabs it and goes and it's the same routine every mm-hmm. day but when he gets home at night he prepares for the next day as soon as his foot walks in the door he <laughs> puts things there and he's he's ready so he's ready to go yeah. so now now the now your mind can be like okay now i can sleep or now i could do what i need to do cuz that stuff's taken care of you're never sitting there fumbling okay did i did i bring my jock did i you know you have a process right. to do it well and I, I know we're jumping all over a little bit here but i want to touch on this too because that's the reason why it's really important to have routine like yeah. it's so funny because people a lot of people they talk about how they don't like routine right, right? they don't like having a routine they want yeah. things to be changing they don't like the same thing every day it gets like monotonous and all this right so that just goes against human nature though right you want to have like a sense of security and a sense of like what knowing what to expect yeah. so that you're not overly stressed about things right because you only have so much mental energy in the day yeah. so so these these small things that you cannot just have set up in advance takes out a lot of mental stress. Something as easy as like figure out what you're going to wear the next day, the night before. Yeah. Right. If you got to go to work and put a suit on or whatever, pick your shirt and tie and whatever laid out the night before. Yeah. So you get up and you don't have to make that decision in the morning. Right. You don't have to expend energy because it is stressful. Like as, as small as it seems, it does stress you out to have to make decisions like that all the day, like the whole day. So if you can cut a lot of that out, yeah. And you save yourself a lot of that mental stress that you wouldn't have. And that's the beauty of routine. That's why you feel better when you're in a routine. That's why yeah. it's it's nice to keep that flow going all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So. If you if you get up in the morning and you're half asleep like I am today because I've was i been skating late at night. Uh, I can't believe I used to do that every day. 
early in the morning, late at night. But if you, so anyways, you wake up and you're groggy and you haven't taken the time to get your clothes sorted out. I know this sounds weird, but you get in there and you know, you're scratching your, scratching your nuts and, you know, <laughs> and you get up and you put on a red shorts with an orange shirt and you think you're looking great, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, and everyone's yeah. looking at you yeah. like, because oh, you didn't take the time to take two minutes to, yeah. to check yourself because you're tired, right? Yeah, well, it, it sucks all that <laughs> out. It, it does suck all that out for you though, right? You can just it get does. up and go and it's yeah. the same thing every day and then you yeah. can just focus all your energy on making yeah. impactful decisions on your day instead of, I was just of, thinking know? about Charlie like a few years ago when he would think he'd look great because eh? he's a little kid no, yeah. and he didn't Doesn't know, know what matched and yeah. that's, I use red and orange because uh, Christine would look at him and go, Son, you can't leave like that. You go, what, what? Well, you got red shorts on and an orange shirt. Like you can't, if it looks ridiculous, yeah. right? That's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, I wanted to just, before we get into our, our, our talk today, is I wanted to say it doesn't take long. So the first wave of COVID that we had, um, how long were, I that's think we were year. off for three, yeah, it's a year, almost a year now, but we were, I think everybody was off the ice in, here in Ontario for like three months, three and a half, maybe even four. It was a long no, time. No, 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 it was just two. Are you sure? Yeah, December 14th was No, the no, day. no, no, the first wave, last March. Or April. Oh, last March, oh, I actually don't remember. Yeah, so I think I it was remember. three, four months. Yeah. It was the longest I have, haven't have skated. Yeah, because we didn't touch it until like June. That's exactly, right. Exactly, yeah, July, right. first of July. Yeah. So, so uh, the reason I'm saying that is... Um, Everybody was really excited to get back on the ice. And for me personally, outside of the time that I that I uh, wanted to take a hiatus from hockey, it's the longest period of time I've ever not skated. So I was like, I was excited to get back on the ice yeah, too. You were. Oh yeah. So so, but do you remember the kids? Like they couldn't wait to get back on the ice. They're just, oh my god, we got to play hockey again. But we didn't get to play. We got to have start off with ten guys on the ice doing drills and stuff like that. But the kids are so excited and rusty and stuff. And I remember that first couple of days, the kids came out with like firecrackers, and and that, and Eric Wellwood was on the ice with me uh, training the kids. And within a week, it wasn't even the full week. By probably day three, you could see the the excitement level start to dip mm -hmm. and I had to address it I'm like guys do you remember where you were in the last three months and then so we got through that and then we created some programs and it was great and then we've had this last little dip where they haven't skated for almost two months or two months yeah, two months yeah. and it's the same thing happened so yesterday I came I had to address a couple of the groups and I go guys what no maybe it was a Monday which to me makes no sense because I get fired up for Mondays because yeah. I get to do what I love to do but I was with the kids again and I go, we got some drafted kids and stuff and I'm going, well, what, what's going on? I'm like, you're responsible for the energy. But my point is like, it's, it's, it's amazing how fast you get back to normal where mm -hmm. you really are. What, and we were talking about earlier, homeostasis, mm -hmm. right? When we talk about that in the, the, the fitness world is, is, is you, you get excited, but motivation, that word motivation doesn't actually last. You have to be driven. Yep. And kids are motivated or parents are motivated to get them on the ice and get back to normal. But are they really? And, 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 and by and large, I see a large group of kids that are motivated for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, it's funny because once you come back, like you come back to that, that like equilibrium point where it's like, oh, you miss it, you miss it, you miss it. And then you get, you get back. It's so funny how much or how easy it is to forget what you felt like just two weeks. So it's funny. I was talking to the, the kids uh, over the break. I was doing like some online coaching and stuff for them. So I was keeping in touch, like just like messaging and, and whatever, did a couple of Zoom things. And uh, I was saying to them, because they're all bummed out because they don't get to skate and all this. And I'm like, boys, in a year, in two years, when this is all done, you're literally going to forget. You're yeah. going to have, it, it's going to be such a small. It's a blip. Yeah. Such a small point in your brain of something that happened that you won't even remember what it felt like that you don't get to do the thing you want to do. Yeah. And it, it, go, it comes back to that little self-awareness thing that we're talking about, right? It's yeah. if you're not, if you're not a person and it's tough again, when you're kids, cause you don't have really the maturity yet to do this. So, you know, in the last few episodes we were talking about, you know, trying to develop yourself to, to make sure you're ready to go and you have that edge before everyone else. But it's really, it's really hard if you're not constantly analyzing where you're at, what you're doing, writing things down, it's really hard to appreciate what you actually have, especially, yeah. especially as a kid, yeah. because it's just part of your life. Like yeah. I just go to hockey today or yeah. I don't go to hockey today yeah. or whatever. Right. It's hard to appreciate what, how much, how good it can be. And you see 
this past week, like how fast it just it's fast. It's, gone. it's one. You're week. the most excited guy on the ice. You're saying. Well, it's and like, this so so going there. That's what I told the kids. I called them in after, and I said, and and Eric was really good because uh, his piece was well. What, what I said to them, I said, listen, if you're going to be a hockey player, you can't. Because I stopped it during the the session as well. I said, if you if you want to be a hockey player, guys, you have to be. You have to bring your own energy. You can't wait for me. I, trust me, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I've when I'm on the ice, I know exactly how it's going to go. When you see my energy, I'm out there, and I, it's it's on. This is what we do. We want to be hockey players. So my mindset's there. And I told the kids, I said, "You're the energy. You have to bring it. Don't wait. Like it's like the thermometer theory, right? The thermometer or thermostat. You um, you don't want to be the thermometer. That just tells you what the what the temperature is. You want to be the thermostat. You want to set it. You know what I mean?" Don't don't let someone else set it for you. That not your coach, not your mom, not your dad. Not a good day, not a bad day, not yeah. anything else. Yeah, you, it's got to come from you. It's got to come from you. Yeah. So you know that's why it's important to find a purpose in every drill that you're doing. Come to the rink with with a purpose in mind, so that you you, you say, okay, I got something to work on specifically. So now when the drill starts and other guys are lollygagging or they they don't feel like bringing it, you still have it. Mm-hmm. That, well, and that's what it does because when you play hockey, it's not like you think about it, if it's after a week or a week and a half of getting back on the ice. And if you have to find motivation, okay, you want to be a hockey player? Good luck playing in the OHL or college or, or in the NHL when you're playing three games and three nights and you're traveling and you're tired, like legit tired, not just, you know, I was watching too many video games or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a big difference. Well, I want to circle back on that motivation thing we touched on a, a minute ago. I remember telling you this maybe like a few years ago when I really started to dig into like reading books and like starting to actually get the mental part of things going. Mm -hmm. So I would have been just, just scratching 20, maybe around 2021 when I started doing this like in depth. And I remember I would read like strictly motivational books, just like things that got you fired up, whether it was Navy SEAL guys or like Tony Robbins or whoever motivate motivation manifesto type guys like all of these books that just get you fired up yeah but they don't actually tell you what to do right so i remember i said this to you a bunch of times i would come in i'd be like man i'm having i'm having trouble right now because i keep reading these like self-help books yeah and i think that's a good first step like it's a good first step to to branch into the the you know self development type yep. of mentality which is yep. really good and everyone should want to have yep. but after you're motivated it's like okay now i'm motivated yeah. now what do i do yes now i need like action steps yes. like i need to actually go into the domain that i'm i'm working at yeah. and i need real things that i can do in real life it's yeah. not just you got to be hungry you got to work for it you yeah. got to blah right yeah. that gets old yes okay so now i'm motivated now what do i do yeah. and so some of the guys that that one in particular that I'm thinking of, he'll sometimes he'll make the comment like, oh, I'm just, I feel like I'm losing motivation. Like, I feel like I'm not motivated and whatever. Yeah. And it's like, you think you're going to always be motivated? Right. Like you're, you're not, nope. you're going to have moments of motivation, nope. but it's like that episode we talked about, like finding your purpose yeah. and, and you need your purpose to drive you. Yeah. Otherwise when the motivation is gone, you got nothing. It's easy to do yeah. a workout when you're all hyped up and feeling good. Yeah. What about when you're not? Yep. Like the motivation shouldn't be a factor. That's just a bonus, right? So when these guys come out to skate with you, it's that you should have your purpose driving you so that you have some action steps and you have a reason to do the thing that you're doing rather than just like, oh, I'm excited to be on the ice today. And then the day that I'm not excited to be on the ice, I don't care anymore. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I'm not excited. I don't exactly. care about moving, right? Exactly. So. Yeah. Having having the purpose is, is huge. I mean, you have to you have to know what you want out of life, right? So, I mean, we talk hockey. So, that, I mean, it's pretty simple. You can watch a Rocky movie. And you can get motivated, but how does it apply to your hockey? Well, it's actually pretty simple if you watch a Rocky movie. Okay, this guy kind of dedicated his life and, you know, never give up and all that stuff. So you apply it to your training, you apply it to your shooting, you apply it to, you know, your mental toughness, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think if you're a hockey player, it's pretty simple. If you're a salesperson, it's a little, a little maybe it might be a little tougher. But you know what? The, your action is, you know what? Make the phone call. Do, yeah. Do the thing. Do the well, yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, you want to get to the point where like the motivation part of it isn't necessary. Yeah. Right. So even like for me now, I I love working out. Like yeah. I'm a, all into working out multiple times a day. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. I love doing it. I am almost never like motivated to work out. Yeah. Like that feeling where you, you like just crush a pre-workout and finish watching uh, Rocky one when he goes 12 rounds with Apollo yeah. Creed. I don't feel like that almost ever anymore right yeah but just as as it's a, it's like i am 
Yeah. Right. If you yeah. were to look at me in the gym working out and doing my thing and, and yeah. getting after it, yeah. you would you wouldn't know. Yeah. Right. You would think, you would think I'm motivated. so jacked. Yeah. It's like, oh man, yeah. how do you how do you get so fired up? Like yeah. how? And it's like you do it. I just do it. Yeah. The motivation is just a bonus now. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. No, hundred uh, percent. Eric. So before we go into the meet. Eric uh, Wellwood yesterday was good, but after I said my little rant to the kids, uh, not not a rant, just t- telling them, and they love, and the kids said after they said thank you for t- t- talking to us like that because I, I, we know you care, so that was that was nice to hear. But uh, Eric told them said, listen guys, like I as a coach, because he coaches in the OHL, but he goes, I, I as a coach, I'm not going to ever ever push you to work harder. I'm not. That's just not what I'm going to do because if you come and you don't practice hard today, and then like this is how my team works. If you don't practice hard today, and, and then when you come to the rink and you're on the scratch list, and you say, well, I wonder why I'm not playing today. It's because you didn't really feel like practicing. Yep. Or you didn't, you know, you have a whole bunch of turnovers and your give a shit meter's on low. Then you just go in the stands. He goes, I don't need to explain it anymore. He goes, I'm not, and most coaches aren't going to. They just, like, I, I don't have time to tell you that you need to work hard and, right. and stuff like that. So Yeah, that's baseline. That's baseline. Yeah. 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 What do we want to talk about today? Uh, preparedness. So... Uh, I was thinking about this when you were kind of spelling out your idea for today. Yeah. And uh, this is something that's huge for me because we've talked about this a lot about uh, it's undervalued being prepared. And I have a joke. I don't have a joke. My brother has a joke. He's always he's always, he's always chirping me about like it annoys him, like how prepared I am. for. It things. annoys me. Yeah. You like, know that. Yeah. Like it's annoying. Yeah. Like I have like if I'm going out, I have always have a water bottle just in case I'm <clears> thirsty. <throat> like I always have. Any like any little stupid thing that I need yeah. to be yeah. ready for whatever yeah. the situation is that I'm in, yeah. I almost always am on point with it, have it yeah. ready to go, yeah. right? And uh, so I was thinking about, I was thinking about it with myself, and then I started thinking about it in the context of of hockey and the stuff that we do. And I remember you you telling me the story about uh, when you went to Russia mm-hmm. with uh, Igor wanted you to go to Russia, and there was a couple of funny ones in there, oh, God. but. Uh, but kind of talking about, you know, how elite of an opportunity that was for you. Like that was a high end, really like legit setup for you to go and, and train some good players with a Hall of Famer, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, what that probably, what that must have felt like for you, whether, you know, you were excited, nervous or uh, or whatever. So I wanted you to, to kind of peel back the layers on that and, and talk about that from kind of your own perspective. Okay. Well, what do you want me to start with? You want me to start with how I got, how I, how that transpired or how the, yeah, well, yeah, happened. lay the, lay the background. So how, like okay. maybe how you got in touch with Igor, what he, what okay. he wanted and whatever, okay. and then we'll get into that. Yeah. Okay. So that the, the, going to Russia was like a highlight, like, cool. So there's a whole, uh, there's so many layers here. This is probably going to be long. It, hopefully it's not boring. I don't think it will be. Eh? It's pretty, pretty sick story. Okay. So, I was I was building my business. Uh, it was probably going on year ten, and I was having I was having some success, uh, like actually having a lot of success. And I was you know at that point I was training uh, several guys just breaking into the NHL. A lot of junior players, a lot of college players, and I was making a name for myself. And, uh, and over in the States, I was getting a lot of phone calls, like all, all over the place, like all over the place. And like, you can only, you, you only have one ass, you can't ride two horses. So I had a gym and I had different things. So I gave up a lot of opportunity, which was fine because I just had my little baby boy who I love more than anything in the world. Who's 15 now. <laughs> always <laughs> always, always give him the plug. I love that oh, kid yeah. <laughs> so much. He's such a good little human. Um, anyway, so I was, uh, at the, at the time I was, tr- I was coaching a lot of, uh, us players training a lot of players and then I got offered an opportunity to coach a team and they offered me money and I hate to say it that way but there's no way I could have done it because I had a business I told them that I said listen I have a business and for me to go and coach I just don't have the time and they said well how much like how much and so they they made a a a pretty nice offer that and I didn't do it for the money but it had to be something so anyways I started coaching there and at in around that time I started um, uh, a a relationship not like (laughs) a a friendship yeah. with because we're in a hockey relationship with Ian Pulver, who is uh, it just came out of the NHLPA, and was now a uh, and he's been on one of our podcasts and and was now breaking into being an NHL agent, and he had some players that uh, that I worked with, and he called me one day because Igor Larionov was a partner was becoming a partner in his uh, agency, 
So Ian called me one day and he said, Andy, um, I, when are you on the ice in Detroit again? And I said, well, it's actually going to be tonight. So he goes, okay, Igor Larionov has heard about you and he's got a couple kids that he would like you to, to train. Is there any chance they can come on the ice? with you and it was a good timing because the season it was in between seasons so i said yeah for sure like yeah bring the kids so the one kid uh that i remember the name was dennis yan and dennis yan was a russian that moved to the states and was a i think first overall in the quebec league and uh he was he was a good player um and he was that age group of the kids i was training so anyways i said yeah come on so that night we were running our our stuff and igor larry was he opened the door at the side of the rink and he's like, Andy, Andy, come here, come here, come here with his heavy a- a- Russian accent. Go, come here, come here, come here. So I'd go over there and he goes, you're coming to Russia with me. So I'm like, oh, well, huh? <laughs> what? So, he goes, so I said, well, Igor, cool, but I, I have to run this, eh? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, after after the, the session was done, I got off the ice and he grabs me and he goes, okay, you, you, you got to come to Russia with me and train my players. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's settle down. So as we went into this, the dressing room that I changed and he sat beside me and I'm first of all sitting there, like I don't, I do not get star, starstruck by anything, but I read growing up, I read, you know, I had to keep my mind sharp and I read, uh, uh, Tarasov, who is the godfather of Russian hockey. I read his book and Tretiak's book, the goalie. And, uh, so I'm sitting there and, and he was in some of these stories. So I'm sitting there going, this is funny because at the time Russian hockey when I was when I grew up was like at the the, the oh, Canada Cups and all stuff. Yeah. yeah, they're like the Krutov, Makarov, Larinov, the, and you go the the Green yeah. Line, and he was on the Green Line. It was a, they won everything, so it was such good hockey. I used to watch this guy, and I like I'm like I said, I'm not a I'm not a I'm never a fan of anybody, but I was like this this is like one of the, this is the Wayne Gretzky of Russia. So he's sitting there asking me to go there. So a side note here, as we're talking, I said, hey, uh, since since I have you here, like. Uh, is that true that Trechak used to ca- have to ha- carry a ball with him all the time and they used to do like somersaults in the snow with their equipment on it? He goes, how do you know that? With an accent, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I said, no, I read this book uh, and this book. And he goes, oh, wow. So it was like it, it built a common bond with us even even better. So all he was doing was trying to get me to go to Russia. So as I, I so anyways, that was a good point. If I didn't read those books, that would have been a, a something that I didn't know about the Russian history. And when I read those books and watching the Russians play, one of my major goals in life was, uh, I, of course, I wanted to after after playing was when I started my businesses. I want to go all over the world and do this, and I want to go to Russia. I want I would love to train Russians or uh, Soviets at the time, right? Yeah. So he uh, he goes, I need your passport and and and. I said, well, what are the dates, man? Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, it was happening fast. And so he has, as an agent, he had about 40, f- over 40 guys mm-hmm. that were high, high-end prospects from Russia. And he wanted me to fly to Russia for 14 days, or I think it was 14 days, to, yeah. to spend six hours a day on the ice with these guys. Okay, so p- pause for a second. Sure. So um, what I'm going to do as you're doing this is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pause it because you yeah. just you just touched a good point maybe I think by accident. Yeah. So you read these books. Yeah. And you obviously at the time you were reading the book you weren't doing it anticipating that you'd be sitting next to you were Larry to ask him questions. But No, I read those books because I wanted to be the best hockey player I can. It was right. it was entertaining but I was like looking at the training methods. Right. But nonetheless, you read the books and you were ready to have a conversation with the guy named Igor, right? So, ready. exactly. So the way that I'm thinking about this is, I remember um, we would go into uh, at school. Mm-hmm. So we would do these like engineering internships, whatever. So we'd have mm-hmm. to go to these interviews, right? And it was amazing, amazing. We would do like these mock interviews with uh, like the people that were in the faculty and whatever. So yeah. you're talking to someone who it's not Igor Larionov, but you're talking to some like PhD brainiac guy and you have to have a conversation. They are going to hire you. Right. Yeah. So when you're going, it was amazing. Like these kids, so they would have their, their pretend company that they're going to do their mock. And this isn't even the real one. This is just a pretend one. Right. And they're still like freaking out because they don't know how to have a conversation or anything. And they would go in and like not do any research on who it was that they were talking to. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you're talking about that, obviously you weren't doing research to talk to you or Liana, yeah. but I'm just, I'm point, making the point that when you have an opportunity that comes up, you want to be ready to, to give yourself the best chance to succeed in that environment. So if it's a job interview or you're going to Russia or whatever, and you, you know that something is coming, 
right? There are certain things that you can do to be ready. So if you're going to go on a job interview, like maybe you should research the company. Like maybe you should have some context because then you can, like you said, establish a relationship. You can establish some common ground with the person that you're talking to because, yeah. and now it's that much stronger. So because you had that context with the way that the Russians used to train and, and that has nothing to do with you, that's you taking an interest in them. Yeah. And now you can talk to Igor in a language that he speaks. Yep. And I was like, well, it was, and that's a great point because when I said that to him, he was like, you could see his ears perk and his eyes exactly. go, oh, yeah. Oh, you're interested in right. my side. Yes. And I mean, it was like, wow. And he says, oh, I got, I wrote a book too. And he, but he, they were out of print and stuff, but I, I'm sure I can get, mm-hmm. I'm sure I could ask him to go find yeah, one, yeah, but yeah. I'm not going to bug him about yeah, yeah. it. I kind of know him better than his book. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was like, it was like, oh, this guy is, 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 is in, he actually took the time right. to read about it, and there's no reason to read about exactly. that. Exactly. And, and it's, it's just human nature. Maybe interesting. It's, it's yeah, but it, it's not. It's just human nature. Yeah. Like, what can you do for me? Yeah. Is is the default mindset for people that are hiring you to do work, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I need you to do something for me. Yeah. So if you can beef up your your mental resume to them because yeah. you have some context of where they're coming from and what they're doing, mm-hmm. then the opportunity just increases because now you have relationship. Now you have common ground. You have something you can talk about. And now Igor goes away. Like, man, this Andy guy. Like, he actually knows. Yeah. knows a lot of the stuff about what we do in Russia. Like he might yeah. be a really good, good yeah. choice here. I think I might have made a really good decision. Like that's something yeah. that's good. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out before you, yeah. you keep going. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then I was asking him stuff. I said, so like really like about the training and the insanity that they went through. Right. The, so, and, and he told me that day, he goes, yeah, they, this is all true. He goes, Andy, we used to go 11 months away from our family training, training, training under uh, not well, Tarasov at first, but he played under Tikhanov. And uh, he goes, it was just insane, and it was just crazy, a lot of dissension. But they created a, a mm-hmm. chaos that, and it was the Red Army, right? Yeah. And you just had to do what and, you had to do. Right. And now he's talking. Right? Yeah. And well, now he was he's telling me everything about it. I was so intrigued. Yeah, he's like, like passionate about it, and he's yeah. like, yeah, I can talk to Andy about this. And what's, what was really neat about it is once I got there, what I'll get when I get there to admit it, I experienced it. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it was sick. It was terrible, yeah. but it was awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so you just said okay. you're you're 14 days that he wants you to go to Russia yes. to train yes. and you, now it's set up yeah. for you to go. Well, before I even go there, I, I so I got off the ice and there's a couple of parents that said, what did, what did Igor, what did Igor want? Like Igor Leono wanted to talk to you. You're in there for a long time. And I go, yeah, I'm like, guys, he wants me to go to, go to Russia and train his prospects. And they go, really? You're going? And I go, yeah, I think so. I got to work out my schedule and, and talk to my family. And, and so anyways, it was, like I said, I'm not a, f- I, I'm never a fan. I, 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 you know, it's, it, it, I wrote this down. Luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. Is that what it was? Yeah. Well, well you can, you can recognize yeah. something cool that's going yeah. on without being yeah. a fanboy necessarily. Yeah. Like Igor Leonov's got yeah. some clout, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but for me, it was the ultimate compliment. Yeah. Not that I was looking for a compliment, but even, you know, you do want to have feedback knowing that you're doing a good job. Oh, everyone likes like, the when, pat when, on the back, yeah. man, for sure. Yeah, but but when Bobby, Bobby's dad says, hey, that was a great clinic, that doesn't mean as much as right. like, Igor Larionov or Chris Draper yeah, or, yeah, you sure. know, some of the NHL guys. Um, so anyways, I get this and I was like, my head was actually spinning because I said, this is a goal I wanted. So I got in the car and uh, to drive home back to Windsor and I call my wife and I go, hon, you're not going to believe this, but Igor Larionov is setting up for me to go to Russia to train his players. And she she knew who he was a little bit. And she goes, oh, oh that's that's great. I go, no, no, it's freaking unbelievable. Yeah. Like, it, But she was so happy for me. Yeah. So we got to find the dates. She, he needs my passport, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm doing this no matter what. So, um, and for me, it was just like, this is validation of the work that I put in. That, th- this was like, but but now you say yes to this, Mr. Paquette. Yeah. Buckle you say up, yes to this. This is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Are you good? Yeah. Are are do you have the ability? So now it's like, okay, are you actually for real? Because now a Hall of Fame, uh, Stanley Cup winning guy, Olympic winner, is is hiring you to do a job. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. So we 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 book in the process of bo- this is a long story, but the process of booking the thing and all this stuff was was interesting in itself. So as we're getting closer. He goes, okay, so I want every day, six hours a day, all different drills. <laughs> I don't want them to last that long either. I wanted, I, because, okay, so it wasn't just for them. There's a whole bunch of coaches that he brought in to watch so they can get drills. So I said, well, I, huh? 
So I, I, th- that day we were sitting in the dressing room, I was going, okay, what do you, okay. I, I asked him an honest question. I was just being honest. I believed in myself, but I asked him an honest question. I said, okay, Igor, I have a question for you. I said, you're sitting here in Detroit, Michigan, and you have access to anybody in the world, anybody, to go and train your players. Why me? So he looked at me and goes, because you'll blow their doors off of them. Because So he wanted it for the players and for the coaches to learn skill stuff. Mm-hmm. He goes, you'll blow the doors off them. I go, okay. I said, but anybody in the world, like in Russia, there's nothing like, he goes, there's no one like you. So I didn't say, oh, really? <laughs> I'm like, really? Cool. So I'm like, this is a task now. So not only to have players, there was like, like not the stands full, but like a lot of coaches and high level coaches. There's some KHL coaches, world junior team coaches watching my stuff and filming it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, the, number one. So now we're, I get ready to go. I'm, as it's coming, I'm fired up. Now there's things going through my head. It's not doubt, but it's, I don't know what the right word is. It's, it's like. There could be some doubt. Some has, you're a well, little, bit, little bit hesitant about what, what yeah, you're going to do. Guess, like, do I actually got the goods here? Like, yeah. do I got enough to deliver on this? Yeah. You know? So, so we, we get to the airport. This, now this is where it goes nuts. So my wife drops me off at the airport and I, you know, I give her a knuckle sandwich or whatever I gave her. <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And and at the time, my, my son was just a little baby boy. And not, not a baby, but he was in diapers and stuff. So I knew I'd miss him, but it's like, hey, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. So I got, anyways, get to the airport. And I had a breakfast sandwich. Oh, and, and my wife, I said, I, I need some underwear just to, <laughs> like a whole pile of underwear because I'm going to be skating all day just so I can take them and throw them out. So we stopped at a store out there and we bought a package of underwear. They were the funniest things. They're like, uh, like uh, what do they call them? Not Hanes, just like the worst underwear. Like oh, nothing yeah. that, like nothing that you want to undress with yeah. a girl. <laughs> <laughs> They're just to hold your balls. They the, yeah, they were, the, they were a toss out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah toss yeah. these out the second like you're done. Wranglers, they yeah. were Wranglers. They were Wranglers. I'm like, wow, look at these the straps for this bit. <laughs> it's like diapers. Uh, so, anyways, we got that. So, I get to the airport, check in, da 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 da. So, I had time to eat. So, I'm sitting there with my ticket. I'm kind of nervous. I got nine hours or 10 hours to get to Russia, and I had to skate the next day. I basically landed, gonna have a quick sleep, and I'm gonna be on the ice. So, what happened was, I'm sitting there having an egg sandwich, and I hear, yeah, uh, flight to blah 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 to New York. So, it was New York first. Flight to New York, flight number blah 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 to New York uh, has been canceled. So, I said, flight to New York so I check and I go come on so my flight is canceled I'm like come on man and I'm this this part of the world like organizing like like I know this sounds I'm not that guy go and yeah. my ticket and organize this like now you've you, now uh, yeah. this is bad yeah so anyways I, fu- I go to a ticket and I said listen I or to the, the desk and I go listen I have to be in Moscow at this time to actually work I have to get there and so she she found a different flight. Uh, it was straight to Sweden to somewhere else, Finland and whatever. And then it took a little bit longer and it was just, just dragged on, but it wasn't leaving for another eight hours. So now I'm at the airport by myself and now I'm, now it's starting to go. All right. This is part of the process. Kind of cool. So anyways, I tell the lady at the desk, at the kiosk, I go, so there's no chance that you're losing my shit. Are you? <laughs> no, of course not. Guess what happens? <laughs> I, I go in, my eyes are closed, like I'm tired, I'm anxious, and that whole flight, no, not yet. As I'm getting into Moscow, I'm flying over, and it's starting to get so freaking real. I'm going, I wonder what the ice is like. I wonder if the, the nets are the same, the, the yeah. pucks. Uh, what's the atmosphere like? I'm thinking of everything. I'm, I, I'm thinking Red Army, man. This is like one of the best hockey players in the world. This, like, all these things are going through my head, but I'm fired up. And as we're going into Moscow, all I see is traffic. Like, I mean, traffic, like you wouldn't believe. Like, if mm-hmm. there's four lanes of traffic, there's actually six cars wide. Yeah. And if, as soon as there's a space they go, there's no emission controls, anything like that. I'm going, wow. So, anyways, we fly in and I'm waiting, and there's a guy there looking for me, but I didn't know because I'm just waiting for my freaking bag. Well, little do I know. This guy comes and goes, Andy, like with this heavy accent, he could speak English a little bit. He goes, let's go. I go, I, I don't have my stuff. So we start going. He goes, what do you mean you don't have your stuff? So he goes, like, you can't do this in North America. He goes to the desk. We're in the back 
of the airport security stuff. And I'm going, I, can I do this? But anything, every time we do something, we'd go to a next desk and next desk. We had to fill things out by pen. Mm. I'm going, come on, man, what's going on here? Like, this is crazy. And I thought I was going to get shot or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it was weird. And this guy looked like oh, he yeah. go back there. So anyways, this guy puts me in. So you, your equipment won't be here. Nothing's going to be here. So now I'm there with the clothes on my back and like, like a little bag yeah, of something. Carry on, I don't know yeah. what it was. Yeah, a book and, yeah. you know, I didn't even have shaving stuff. I had toothpaste and stuff. I didn't have shaving cream yeah. or anything like that. So we, he, he, I get in this guy's car and we drive for maybe 10 minutes through the airport and he drops me off with another guy picking me up at the end. So on this, on this road, there's like, it's like a big tent. And I go, what's going on? And he goes, oh, someone else is taking you to your hotel. I'll go, okay, fine. <laughs> Why didn't you just take me? Anyways, so he, this guy picks me up, doesn't speak one lick of English that this, and this, I didn't know what they were, but they're actually com- common over there. They're like these big tents, and they sell tea and sm- smokes and Coke. There's a big Coca-Cola sign. So this guy gets in, and he's yelling at me. Not yelling, but he's talking loud in Russian. Because what happens when you don't know someone's language, you yell at them. They think, because that's usually how you understand it more, right? <laughs> so I said, Igor. So Igor calls. Igor, I call Igor, and he goes, oh, hey, welcome to Russia. And I'm like, thanks. Uh, like, What's going on, man? He goes, oh, uh so the hotel that we booked you he goes it's it hasn't been built yet <laughs> huh so he goes we're gonna we're gonna be we got a new place for you whatever so i said how long is it gonna take so i'm looking at this traffic i said is the traffic like this the whole time he goes oh yeah, yeah it's gonna take you another four hours i'm like wow and it was only like if in real time if we were to drive something it'd be like a 40 minute drive <laughs> four hours brutal no emission so this guy doesn't speak he stops at a mcdonald's he goes you want something to eat. that's not something I ever eat. So yeah. I'm sitting there going, okay, uh, I can't even say Mc, I, McChicken. Yeah. And they look at me like, what, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, like everything's yeah. weird. Like yeah, everything yeah, yeah. is so weird. So anyways, go to this hotel, which was my hotel. He stops in this place and this brought me back to the Soviet, the Red Army. Because we go to this gates and he gets out of the car and he opens a trunk and I go, here? And he goes, yeah, like whatever, da. So I grabbed my stuff. He walks in and it, it was, uh, what, what it turned out to be, I was like, what is this? Cause there was a field like just beat up. There was little kids running around with like wife beater shirts and mullets and smoking and drinking. And it was like, where the heck am I? <laughs> this is, so it turned out it was an old mental institution that they turned, like they rent rooms at. And I'm like, am I in the right place? So this, the guy is talking to the guy. The, so the guy at the front desk is in a security army outfit with, I, I can't remember. I, yeah, they were armed and they were talking and then they'd look at me and they'd talk and look at me. I'm like, I might get shot here. <laughs> I, I really think I, I honest God, I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Anyways, they bring me to this little wee tiny room. The, the, there was a, so you can just, you can just picture the real old school. If you can picture, look up the old school Soviet Union. That's exactly what it was. So for the for the for an instant, I was sitting there going, "What am I doing?" And then once I got settled in that room and I realized, uh, well, I, what happened? I went outside. And I said, "What am I doing?" It's ten o'clock at night or eleven o'clock at night in Russia, Moscow. It's still bright outside, and I was sitting on a park bench in the property that we're on, and I see these guys walking by, a roughly mid like 18, 17, something like that. So I go, hey. And they look at me, I go, uh, hockey? So the one kid, it turned out to be Sergei Tolchinsky. He played for um, Carolina. He goes, yeah, he could speak really good English. So I go, guys, are, are you, I'm here for Igor to do a camp. They go, yeah, yeah, we're all staying here. I said, so I was like, oh, okay, there's, I can settle into this. Yeah. Cool. So I got in my room and I'm looking, it's the size of this. They gave me a pillow, a shitty pillow, and I said, "You know what? It was dis- it was dirty. There was a little fridge about this big. Like I don't know what I use it for." And I'm like, "This is actually what I want. This is this is I'm living the experience of what these guys like what I grew up watching. Mm-hmm. So I I embraced that, and it was freaking awesome. So I call Igor that night and I go, Igor, uh, or I don't have stuff. He goes, "Oh, my brother will bring you some shaving cream and some shampoo and stuff." So he brought me that and I had this shower that it was broken and no alarm clock. And at seven, they just said seven o'clock in the morning or six in the morning, whatever it was, there'll be cars outside to take you to the rink. I said, good enough. Yeah. That's a shake up to your life. eh? Yeah. Like, Jesus. But it was like uncertainty the whole way. Oh yeah. For yeah. sure. So, uh, 
Anyways, we got to the. Do you want to ask anything about that? Or no, no, go. Okay. That was just a good. Is, story. It, is it okay? Is yeah. it boring? No, no, it no. Good? good story. Are you sure? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so I get to the rink the next day, and Igor told me don't bring skates or don't bring your stick or anything because they were sponsored by Torsible. So, anyways, I get to the rink in the morning, and there's all these coaches there, and these interview like like uh, they're they're talking, and he's teaching them stuff. So I was on the ice, going on the ice. I said, listen, I don't have any anything. He goes, okay, you can wear my skates. Well, his skates are about probably two sizes bigger than mine. And tracksuit and all that stuff. So I'm on the ice for the first, uh, it was literally one week. It was six days. I was on the ice six hours a day with skates that were too big. I was dying. And, oh, and yeah. for me, it's like I, I was so out of my comfort zone with that. And I got these people on film. So I was like, my skills were like, like I don't know if they're good right now. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, it was six hours a day coming up with new drills and stuff like that, working with these guys. And it was like, it was, uh, it was tough. You know, it was great, but it was like, my mind was on my feet and stuff and I'm just hoping I'm doing the best job that I can. I can't take a shower at the rink. I'm just a, just an absolute mess, disaster at the end of the day. And then we'd go out and have some fun and stuff like that. But on day, um, it was Saturday. Igor says, we're going to go. It was the first time him and I just went out together with his wife. And he says, uh, on Saturday, we're going to go downtown because the place where I was training was in, it was called Balashika. So if you can picture Toronto, it would be like, uh, Vaughn or Mississauga. Yeah, it's like outside, not, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which, so we went to the big city and we went out for dinner. And this is the coolest story, dude. <laughs> so Igor Larionov picks me up. We're shooting the shit all the way down. And we get into the big city and we go to this. It's called uh, Bosco Mall. Bosco, Bosco. So what it is is it's a huge mall. It's like Roots in Canada. Uh, it's a huge mall called the Bosco Mall. And inside that mall, Okay, so if you can picture, I'm on this side of the table, and and there's this unbelievable restaurant on. And so this is the Red Square here, the Red Square, mm-hmm. like sick. So you got the the Saint Basil's Cathedral. You've got yeah, you're right in the heart it's of it. The, like the the pictures of Russia, yeah. right? The ice cream cone buildings and the, and and Lenin's tomb and all that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we we go in there, and right away, like he's Wayne Gretzky of the state of uh, of. Uh, Russia. So as we're walking th- through and he's showing me around a bit and people are just, Hey, Igor, you know, like a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So we get to the gates of uh, going into this whole, this restaurant and they come up to him like kissing his ass. Right. And I'm with this guy. <laughs> so they're like, what, what do you want? Do you want to sit back here? And he goes, no, no, no. Cause I'm a guest. He goes, can we get close so he can see this, all this stuff in Russian, obviously. So we sat right at like, if this is the table, there was a gate like a, a fence, like an iron rot fence there. Beautiful. And we sat at this table and I was having dinner looking at, so I was asking him all kinds of questions. Lenin's tomb, the uh, Red, Red Square, the cathedral. And he gave me kind of the history of Russia and the Federation of Hockey oh, man, and all this cool. stuff. And we're sitting there. So anyways, we're, we're going there and 10 minutes in, this guy, the, or a couple minutes in, they bring a big bowl of uh, nice fresh olives and cherries. And that was a neat appetizer. Never seen that yeah. before. So I'm eating away here. And his wife was like the nicest lady ever. But anyways, I'm eating away. And he goes, hey, Andy, do you recognize this song? Well, I, I'm, I'm so like taking it all in. I didn't even know there's someone playing music. They, the, the owners of the, ho- of the restaurant set a guy up like I, five feet behind us, 10 feet behind us with a... Uh, um, mandolin? Mandolin, yeah. And I, and I listen, I go, oh... Hotel California, Come just on. nice and light behind us, and I'm going, oh wow, this is like the <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> this was man. the coolest with night Igor ever. Lariano with Igor Lariano in Moscow, we and I and, he, and and my and and fortunately, my clothes came in that Saturday, mm-hmm. so I got to wear like yeah. I looked, looked okay, looked, looked like a human. The yeah. picture in my in my <laughs> yeah, business, yeah, yeah, I looked yeah. okay, handsome fellow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so then we carried on through the uh, through the um, the the final week, mm-hmm. and and of course everything went well. But at the end of it, he would come in after most sessions and just give me some feedback and it was always like that was fantastic oh that was good that was good and the coaches would start asking me a whole bunch of questions and i'd have to translate one one neat observation i had there was i was sitting in the room because north america is different than than um over there so sitting in the room and I, i was trying to figure something out there was uh like one day there'd be like 20 coaches sitting in there and some someone would look like really nice and another guy would sit there with his hair just like this, missing a tooth, <laughs> but look like a bum. And there's like different levels of that. And yeah. I was being North American. I'd look at the guy that was like rough looking and I'd go, what the hell? Yeah, and Igor, yeah, but yeah. Igor would see them and it would be the same with everybody. He'd give him a big hug, the Russian kiss. His dad was there. It was, it was really neat. Yeah. And they'd all hug and give the Russian kiss and they'd talk and laugh and everybody was treated equal. 
And I'm going, okay, if I'm in North America, that guy walks in and the boys are carving. I'm like, hey, uh, like, you know, you, you just wake up in a dish this morning because yeah. <laughs> that's the way we are. Yeah. But it dawned on me after a while is that you're just fortunate if you could make money there. You're either on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. So they don't actually, they don't judge each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. They don't judge each other. They just they 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 kind of love each other. Yeah, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, no, that's or cool. If that's not weird. And that's a, that's an observation I had about the the Russian culture. In, in fact, in that sense, anyway. Yeah, that'd be a cool thing. Just the whole cultural differences would be really cool to see. But I wanted to to get back to the talking more about like into the meat of the actual training part of it that you were doing. So when you when you're getting there. And like all of your circumstances are non-ideal, right? Terrible. Like everything Worst there. thing possible. Like you lose your stuff. You're staying in a crappy place, not comfortable. It's not your house. They're for, you're in a completely different world entirely, right? Yeah. Wearing equipment that doesn't fit. So mentally for you, what, like, what did you, were there anything, how do I ask this? Were there any specific things that you kind of fell back on or may maybe like any anchors you had to get yourself like checked back in when it was time to go on the ice? Like what did you use to make sure that those things didn't affect you or was it just a no factor because once you hit the ice, you knew you were ready to go? Yeah. So I had some anxiety and, and I do, I still do like, here's the thing. I think it's, uh, I think it's healthy. Like, I think it's healthy not to be arrogant. Do you know what I mean? It's like even when, um couple of years ago, um, another agent called me and it was, they were recommended by, uh, Chris Draper and uh, another NHL guy. They said, uh, Ryan Kressler or Kess Ryan Kessler and, uh, Dylan Larkin and Ian Cole, bunch yeah, of NHL guys one, in yep. the States. Uh, they, they, um, they were looking around. They, I got a call. They said, can you come out and do this thing? And I'm like, yeah, of course I work with anybody anyway but i'm like oh for sure like it's another opportunity another feather in the cap with some really good players but when i went to do it i was like yes but the humbleness in me says okay like prepare be not nervous but be anxious like make sure you do a good job so there's always that okay this is another big stage do a good job and i think that's healthy i think if you're a hockey player you should do that i think if you're running a business you should have a healthy uh anxious nah i don't know what's the word Anxious, nervous, uh, uh, be sure, but what's the word well, that? Um, I think it's, uh, well, you're, you're just talking about having, going into the situation with, with humility, right? So you, yeah. you know that you can Res do this. You have respecting yeah. people's positions yeah, and, and understanding that they, they're stars in the NHL. Yeah. Respecting yeah. the opportunity, respecting yeah. the circumstances, yeah. respecting who's involved and knowing you're going yeah. in and you're equipped to do the job. Yes. But you have to make sure that you're on, that's, right? Okay, so that's, that's that's exactly it. So, yeah, the question is, in Russia, did I feel that way? I felt 100% sure of my ability, but I was a little bit nervous because of the circumstances. Right. But I had um, someone from in CBC who uh, wanted to find out how that trip went, and they were in, in, intrigued how it happened and all that stuff. So they were asking me the same sort of question. They said, were you nervous? Were you intimidated? Were you this? I said, and I said this, first of all, as a hockey player, if you, if you play the game intimidated or in awe of other people, you never, yeah, you're not going to be good. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. So I happen to play with some of the best players, you know, Brendan Shanahan, you know, we played on under 17 together. We were, we were friends. Um, and, and so many, like that's one, but several players like that, that were, that I never said they're better than me. And I never said that I. I, I felt I was better than a lot of them and, you know, stuff happens. So as far as a hockey status goes, like I just didn't play in the NHL, but I knew my abilities and where I come from and my, the clout I have with certain, with people is there. So I'm like, okay, I'm on par there. So I'm never going to be intimidated that way. But what was really, really important was I, and this is important for players and coaches is that I knew I was prepared. I knew that because over the years, I've seen everything from like, well, the first clinic I ever did, I thought I was going to hit a home run. And it was, it turned out that a six year old boy that could hardly skate showed up. That's where I started in, in my training business. Shortly after that, it was a lineup for people to go to my clinics. But then some days, you know what, you'd think you'd have 30 guys on the ice and you'd have six. Some days you'd think you'd have six, you'd have 30 and you'd have to. So I, 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 I knew how to run the ice no matter what. The most interesting thing was when I say I got prepared, is I got prepared because I had to get prepared one day. And what I mean by that is early on, I could, I could get by as an instructor 
doing what I do uh, early on. I'm talking the first year or two. Nah, probably the first year. I could get away by, because I, I could, on the ice, I was so good. Like I could, I was better than anybody that was on the ice with me training, right? And faster and, and you know, I was 30 years old. So it was like yeah, prime right, time. All my high skill and all yeah. that stuff was good. But my communicating, the skill was not elite, not even close yet. But I didn't know the difference. I was, I was you know, ignorance is bliss until it's not bliss anymore. Mm-hmm. So one day I was, so what happened when I was started training guys is early on, the best players in the area, like Ryan Wilson was becoming a high high pick, uh, Eric Wellwood, uh, all these guys were wanting to come and skate with me. So I'm like, okay, that's 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 what matches up better for me. So, so this is early on, and Eric Wellwood and I was showing him something. And I was showing sorry, him. You talk about Kyle. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, Kyle, Kyle Wellwood. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he was he was uh, I was doing something with him. I wanted to show him a specific move. So as I was showing him, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. So I fluffed it that day, but the whole the whole session, I'm going. You're not qualified. You're not qualified for this. As soon as it gets real, like as of right now, you're as good as any guy that's on the ice with you as far as doing your skills and stuff, and you can skate with them, and you'll impress them that way. But right now, you're bullshit. You're not a real instructor. You cannot build a business the way you are right now. If you're going to go on like this, just... That know, was the moment. That was the moment. It punched me right in the face. Mm-hmm. So I pretended, not pretended, but I was able to communicate some things. And I knew drills to make people better but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth so at that moment I was so angry with myself and I didn't have to be angry I was just no, but you I, realized I realized that I'm in, inadequate to actually give advice on hockey yeah. or, or not advice but to teach the skill because I can't explain it all right. I can do is demo it and give you some drills to copy me so at, at that moment I went home and I said I got I, I better figure this out right now and I wrote, I started on a daily basis and I got, I had reams and reams of paper just to get my thoughts out on how do you skate? So that if I said to someone like Eric, uh, yeah, skate harder. That's not a, that's not teaching. Yeah. So I would say, okay, Eric, when you're, I, and I write this down. Okay. I need a, I need, I need a knee bend and I put it in my words. I need a knee bend. I need my head up. I need the, the arm swing like this, you know, the toe flick, the recovery. Yes. And I wrote everything down to every detail. Yeah. So, so that it was like precise. Yep. And I don't use those. I didn't use those notes exactly, right. but I had to get the words out and I would just say it out loud to myself. Okay. If you're going to teach someone how to shoot a puck, yeah. how do you shoot a puck? Yeah. Because most people don't have the details on how to do it. So now if I see someone not shoot, uh, shooting incorrectly or that had a deficiency, I will, and even without doing it, I couldn't recognize the the the, the coaching cues. Mm-hmm. So I, I spent so much time doing that so that all of a sudden now... Yeah, you can articulate it. Yeah. Yes, and that, that's what made me a really good teacher. Right. So it was being prepared. So I, and I always say this, if, if, if I can't be the best in the world at what I do, then I, I don't deserve a dollar. Mm-hmm. That's probably not necessarily true, but like for the quality of work I do. So anyways, when you say preparedness, like, no, when you say, where well, you're nervous or whatever, I don't get nervous about the quality of work that they're going to get yeah. and the quality of information they get. And I know the feedback's going to be great. And I know it's going to be, uh, the best product that they've had Yeah. to, you know, most 100%. likely. Yeah. So, that part was an issue. I knew that I was prepared. I know that if I go and do what I do, it's going to be great. Right. And it's never failed me. Yeah. So it's so, never failed me since that day with uh, Kyle Wellwood. Right. And and so the the point, I mean that, for, I, for you at least, it took the punch in the face. Yeah. For you to be like ah, like I need to get on this right now. Yes. Right. But it doesn't need to take that. No. And that's kind of the message to relay to whether we're talking to the parents, coaches, or, or players, or anyone in a similar situation. It doesn't need to take the punch in the face yeah. for you to start to get prepared, no. right? So if you, like ev- almost everyone that's listening to this, you're not prepared for what you're doing, right? right? Whether you're a, a young player, you're not prepared. You can't be. You're too young. Whether you're a, a minor hockey coach or uh, just starting to be a junior coach or whatever, you're coaching the high school team. You could be more prepared as a coach. You could mm-hmm. have more information to relay. You could sharpen up your knowledge for sure. And if you're a parent, that's an even bigger one because they're probably, in most cases, most cases the least experienced in the game. So you're not prepared to be a hockey parent either. Yeah. So like, instead of waiting for the moment to happen where you realize, oh shit, I wasn't ready to deliver on that moment, mm-hmm. like prepare yourself now. So when the moment comes, whether it's with Kyle Wellwood or whether it's with Igor Larionov or whether your kid finally asks you a question like, well, why though? 
then you'll actually have the tool to to deliver that right yep. and you there's things that you can do to to deal with that right and it doesn't have to be just hockey it could be again it's anything your job you know like me with school i was just going to say to you, I, I i would like you to go through because i watched this so I'll, I'll cue it up for you okay what it was so impressive with you like we've got obviously over the last 10 years we've got to to see each other almost every day talk about a lot of different things and um the reason that eric and i can be probably you know one of the things that a lot of people said about our interactions on the podcast they said it just seems so natural and so good it's because we know each other like inside and out more importantly there we know we haven't bullshitted each other meaning you know like a lot of guys like i've seen you day to day you talk the talk you know like a lot of people say yeah i get i'll get up for the way i've challenged people if you want to work out meet me at five yeah, in the morning or six the in the morning and someone might show up once or twice but they don't do it consistently whereas eric has done it every single time so i've watched this guy grow from a from a teenager especially a teenager to now grow up be responsible but actually in a, such an impressive way that things are so organized and so detailed and so and then and then i look back and i go nothing is really i can't actually say i've seen a time where you've been flustered to be honest mm-hmm. and when you were doing your exams and stuff and i go did i asked you that when you're doing your heavy heavy last minute pro like your big projects and stuff like that for engineering i'm like you, you're not you're not worried about it or your anxiety you go no and you said you studied all the time all the time so just explain that process compared to the other people about being prepared yeah well the i'll, I'll keep it in the context of school because school is something that i really excelled at not even necessarily that i had the best grades because there were kids that did better than me and in, in from like a exam perspective evaluation perspective but i had a great time in school like i loved going to school and i did it by myself i was on my own when i did it and so when I talk about Excel, it's like I, I excelled that way. Where I was like, never, there was never a, there were times that were more stressful than others. And there were times where it was a bit of a struggle, especially like first year when you're first, like it's a change and all that. But once I got to third, fourth year, like I was dialed in on the day to day and I could get, get my stuff done. So one of the things that would always surprise me, even after first year, and it might've been because I had such a crazy schedule that I had to balance. So I couldn't afford to waste time for the most part the the common thing that you hear for kids that are going to university is like oh man i've stayed up all night studying or like uh oh man i have to i got to cram for this exam because i've been doing so many other things like i haven't had time to study for this one and on the odd occasion that happens but for the most part like if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing every day and you have your priorities lined up that should never happen like you should never have to stay up all night to study for an exam there's no ex- like there's no reason that you can't go to bed at 10 the night you have an exam. There's absolutely no reason for that, right? If, the, if you're, you're preparing yourself and that, that is the key, right? And so what that means is, you know, the, 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 the saying goes, drink a little poison every day instead of, you know, like smashing it all at once kind of thing. Right. And that's, and that's what you're doing. You're taking that little bit of pain every day yeah. of studying putting in your time, whether it's an hour or a couple hours to get the job done that day yeah. so that the night before you don't have to smash yourself in the face to try to stay up late and drink five monster energy drinks and not sleep. And, you know, everyone, everyone's the, the, the professors too, they always say that they always say just, if you just study every day, like it's fine, you can handle the workload and you can, that's actually true. Well, it makes sense. Yeah, and everyone says it's not true. And it's so funny because it's like, yeah, it's not true if you want to go out every Friday, Saturday night, or you want to have two other jobs, or you want to have, if, if it's not your priority when you're doing it, something difficult, like engineering was difficult, it's a heavy workload, but it's completely manageable, right? It's completely manageable. So what you need to do, and this is like for the kids in high school too, like some of these kids that come work out, they're talking to me about how much work they have in high school. Right. And I, I don't necessarily blame them because they're kids and they don't know what a workload is. Yeah. But it's like, man, you're telling me an hour a night of homework is out of reach for you. Yeah, it's just you don't want to. You don't want to. Right. Yeah, you don't want it. to. I get it. And that's the thing is you can say I don't want to and that's fine. But then you're not going to excel because then the, the exam's going to come and you're going to fail or you're going to do poorly or you're not prepared or you're not ready, ready to, to do the best you could do because you're not prepared. Right. So in the same way that you were ready when that opportunity came for Igor, because you were on the ice, you were taking, taking the dose of, 
of a poison every day every learning day. learning about okay how do i operate with six guys on the ice how do i operate with 15 what if it's 50 guys what That's if happened. what if five guys don't show up what if i plan for 10 and only yeah. three come yeah. right so you've had all these situations what if the players are this good what if the players are this good what if mm-hmm. they're five what if they're 15 mm-hmm. what if they're in the nhl what if they're not right mm-hmm. these are all situations that you prepared for so that that opportunity came and you could smash it out of the park and you knew you would smash it out of the park yeah and that's what happened with me so in in the school sense right yeah. these exams would come and you would ask me you'd be like man yeah it's got to be got to be tough right now i'm like eh, yeah like it's there's it's a lot of stuff but like it's gonna be fine because i'm ready I did what I was supposed to do. I studied all day. I would get, I would get up, I would go to the gym, go to my classes, and then I would study till six, seven o'clock. Then I would leave school. I would go home. I would take a shower. I'd go to bed. Then I'd get up. I would do it again. Then I'd go to bed. Then I'd get up. Then I'd do it again. Then I'd get up. And then I would do it again. And then the exam would come. And on the day of the exam, you know what I would do? The exact same thing. I would get up, yeah. go to the gym. I would have an eight o'clock exam. I'm going to the gym before still. I'm not, I'm done studying. I did it already. Yep. Right. It's already in there. So now here's my opportunity. Exam comes, right. Or here's my project that I have to do. I got to deliver on this project to the faculty. Right. And then all of them are unbelievably impressed with this project that I did because relative to all my, my classmates or all the other people in the major, they weren't ready. They didn't know. And they didn't know how to have a conversation with, with the professor. They didn't know how to get their work done on time. They didn't know how to write a paper well, where they could articulate the things that they wanted to say. Like you were, like you were saying, you need to, you know, explain how to do a certain move, right? You need to be able to relay that message. Right. Yeah. And that's a skill that you need for everything. I needed that skill when I'm, when I'm delivering my, my presentations to all these PhD people, like I need to be able to explain what I'm doing. What does this do exactly? Like, what does it precisely do? And on top of that, I'm not explaining it to a kid. I'm explaining it to someone who knows better than me what it's supposed yeah. to do. Right. Right. So there's no room for bullshit. Yeah. Right. So all these kids, like in all these other situations, not just hockey, it's like they, the way they talk about it, it's like, there's no other way. Like the, you just have to stay up. You have to stay up to do it or like school's so hard or I don't get this or it's, it's really confusing. And it's like, man, if you just do a little bit every day, Yep. Just do a little bit every day. And yeah. then all of a sudden you're prepared for whatever the opportunity is that comes, whether that's something that's in school, whether that's a hockey opportunity, whether you have a, an interview with a team, whether you have a meeting with your coach or whether you have a meeting with your boss or you have a job interview, like it's all the same shit. It's all the exact same process. It's the exact right? same, yeah. You prepare yourself on the day to day with habits that you make for yourself. And then when the opportunity comes, you can smash it out of the park and then you don't have to worry about it. You might get a little bit of that anxious, nervous energy because it's a new circumstance and yeah. there's like a, a bit element of the unknown. Yeah. And that's what you're going to have. Like you were saying with Igor, that's what you had, right? Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't nerves because you didn't think you could deliver. No, because I, what I did is I took, um, uh, what, I, what I did as over the years is I said, okay, I have, and honestly not even written down anymore. It's just, it's here. So if someone, right. s- someone like when Ryan Kessler called me, he said, uh, I said, yeah, I'll, uh, I can do that for you. I said, what I want to do, I want to be, I want to deliver what you would like. Yeah. And since you're the leader of most of these groups, you know, he's making $10 million a year and everyone respected him as a hockey player. They, I said, what, what would the week look like if I could design the week for you? How would you like it designed? So he gave me, oh, I'd like that, you know, the first day, just straight skills. Uh, next day, like a lot harder with skills. And then he kind of, he, he broke the week down on how he would like it. I said, okay, no problem. Yeah. So then I took that information. I said, okay, first week of skills. So I can, first day of skills. So I said, okay, here's uh, I pick out of my filing cabinet in my head, what skating skills are appropriate for that age for, for, uh, that are not too intense, but they're, they're, that, that are, um, going to get the feet under them or like for, for what he needed. Yeah. How do you deliver the it on day, the purpose? Yeah. Then yeah. how do I do the next day? So I got skating, stick handling, shooting, blah, 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 blah. Very, 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 very detailed. So I'd never run out. Right. So I look at the day and I go, okay, hour one or hour two or day one day, whatever. I go, this will, this will fill in this with a good purpose and it'll flow nice. They'll, this, they're going to get exactly what they want. And I've got so much left over. Yep. And so I just go into that bank now and I go, okay, so stick handling, I got a process where it's, you know, start to finish and then I could just add, you know, I add branches to the tree whenever I want. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, that's, that's the easiest part of my job. Yeah. Now well, it's like, if you say I want to work on one thing and I want to be the best at it, I can do that. Yep. yep. I can do that. Well, and, it, and it's the same for me now, not, not as uh, in depth as you yet, but with the workouts in the gym. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, 
what's the purpose? Like, what are we trying to do? So right now with the groups that we're, we're yep. doing around Charlie's age, it's like a kind of in season mode, yep. right? So when they come in the gym, the goal is not to bury them, right? Right. So I know exactly the same thing. How do I structure this? I go to the filing cabinet of all my exercises. What's going to serve that purpose? Yeah. Sprinkle in a couple elements of everything because we're doing like a maintenance type of thing in the gym. We're not trying to kill them or anything. And then when the phase changes, I go back to the filing cabinet. I can restructure what I have because I've done this for 10 years now. I've built up a, a knowledge base of how to achieve a certain result. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of stuff to pull from, yeah. right? And those are those are the, the, the things that you want to start to lay down for yourself. Again, it's not we're talking about it in the context of hockey, but it's yeah. for anything, right? Yeah, for anything. Develop, develop yourself in whatever you're doing so that you have those things to pull from, right? Yeah. Whether you're, again, coach, player, parent, whatever situation that you're in, yeah. be ready for those situations, right? Yeah. Whether the same, like say it was the same thing with school, like I said before, like whether it's writing an exam or whatever, there's certain steps you can take so that when you're in that, that zone of the super anxiety provoking exam day, yeah. the only reason you have some nervous energy is because there's an unknown exam that's going to be on your desk, not because you don't know the material, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's, that's the key difference, right? Yeah. About being prepared. Yeah. So there was a, there was a quote from Charles Poliquin, who is basically the best uh, fitness trainer that created more Olympians than any other tr uh, strength coach in the world. And he said, uh, and it, it, it just makes sense in this context about being prepared. Like if you just go to a test and cram the night before, it's a dumb approach. And if you go into a job interview or you're interviewing from a hockey team and you know nothing about their team, you don't have answers or th thoughts in your head that you would like to talk about, it's dumb. Mm -hmm. And if you want to run the biz or you want to be a hockey player and you haven't gave any thought to your sleep or your eating or preparedness for the game, that's dumb. So Charles Poli Charles Poliquin's, um, you know, the books for dummies. Yeah, you know? dummies. Yeah, whatever this. for dummies. Yeah. He had a great quote. He said, "Sometimes the dummies approach is just dumb." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. Oh yeah. Right. Well, it in the that's that's a really uh, a really great point too. Like when you're saying for cr like cramming for an and it, and the funny thing is is like it's something that people always say it right. You can't cram. It doesn't matter if it's an exam or if it's your game tomorrow, right? If or, you have, or if, if you want to get in shape, you can't do it. In yeah, a week. right. Like if you have, if you have a game on Friday night and yeah. you stay up till two in the morning on Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you think, oh, I'll go to bed early Thursday, yeah. and I'll be good for my game Friday. Yeah. No, you won't. No, you're not gonna. No, and that's just the facts, right? Yeah. And everyone says this, but then nobody listens when it comes time to deliver. It's like, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't have a choice because I had all these assignments that kept me up during the week. It's like, well, well, what did you do with your day? Like what, mm -hmm. what did, how did you divide your time? How did you prioritize what you were supposed to be doing? Right. Mm -hmm. You knew that your game was coming on Friday. You have a Friday, seven o'clock game. You knew that was coming since the day they released the schedule. Right. So how come on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you weren't getting your ducks in a row so that you're prepared for Friday? Yeah, because life is life. Like you're gonna have other things that you have to do, right? Yeah, you're gonna Espe have to go to grandma's for dinner, even though you don't want yeah, to. Yeah, right. Like es especially when you're a kid and you don't have all the control. Yeah. You don't get to set up your life how you no. want. Like if your parents say you have to do this, you have to do it. Yeah. You have to go to school. Yeah. You have to do your assignments. You yeah. have to do these things, right? Yeah. So figure it out. Yeah. Like figure it out so that Friday you're not blaming your bad habits on schoolwork. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can you can do those things to get yourself ready for Friday. Like and yeah. you can start well in advance because y you know that it's important to prepare yourself for that event you know yeah, what i mean that's right so yeah. uh we got a couple minutes here i don't know if you want to uh swing on touch on a couple other things to to finish up yeah just listen so you have to be prepared i mean we, we can we can drag all the we could drag you know we can make this as long as we ever want it to be but the, uh, the bottom line with this today is that you know when you are prepared when you do everything in your power to to make sure that you succeed at something you're probably going to, to at least a, a, a decent level, right? So that's what happened with me in my business. And the times that I haven't been prepared, you know, I, I really regret that. Mm. So first, the first thing is here for, for the players or the coaches that want to have success in the game is number one, do you actually want it? Like Steve Ott said, right? Everyone says they want it, but do they really? Mm -hmm. If this is something that you want, if this is something that you truly want to have in your life to, to to make something out of your hockey career no one else is going to decide that for you. it has to be you and it's going to be you to the point where it's got to be you to the point where it's 
mm, possibly a pain in the ass to everybody else because you want it so badly. Yeah. That your life is literally about, like Dalton yeah. says, he goes, I, I, how I live my life to get to the NHL and to stay in the NHL. So I put 23 hours were about me and one hour a day was might maybe for someone else, maybe. It was like you there, said. There's that uncompromising un- thing again. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's yeah, that yeah. uncompromising for your goals and your values. So now if you're uncompromising and you actually want this thing, the the decisions that you're going to make become a lot easier. It's not a sacrifice to go to bed early so that you can play well. It's not a, like it was never a sacrifice to me when the when the guys on my team even would say, "Hey, we're we're going to a party or we're going we're going to go out uh, to a movie." And like I'm talking when I'm 14, mm-hmm. I'm like, yep. I'm, I'm good. I, I just want to play hockey. Yep. That's it, that was all my focus was, and it had to be to yep. to to do something that great. Yeah. That big, it's going to take... You get to be elite. You, yes. It's you not, get, I have to do this so that I can yeah. play hockey and, oh, that sucks, I'm missing yeah. this. You like know? when Charlie was asking me the other day, he goes, Dad, what was it like when you put the Team Canada sweater on? I said, Charlie, all the sacrifices, and, and if you want to call it, I never found it to be sacrifices, but yep. all the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears, and the broken ankles, and the bruises all over, and, and the, you know missing out on high school this and high school I, I didn't care i'll tell you what when i put that jersey on when there was it was number 18 when i wore it and you see a red jersey with canada flag on it and a red helmet and the socks and the pants and you're wearing a canada jacket playing with the best guys and you're going to play the soviet union or finland or something the feeling that you have there is nothing like it mm-hmm. i would do that in a heartbeat every single day of my life to to have that so what is preparing for it? It's like you're eating, literally eating, sleeping. Like w- there's there's that saying, or a, there's a, there's a thing that says that, that if you're gonna be uh, if you're gonna do something, like let's say hockey player, you could uh, you could have relationships, you can have school, you can have hockey. He goes, but you keep pick pick one, pick one, or what is it? How does it go? Pick, pick two. two, pick two. Yeah, I can't do you three. can't do all three. It's uh, and, sorry, I'm gonna sharpen yeah, that you, up for yeah. you. It's <laughs> tighten it up. It's, yeah, it's it's. <laughs> Because they used to say this in university because yeah. it was really true. It's you have your social life, you have school, and you have athletics. There you go. Perfect. You get two. Yeah. If you two. try to do three, yes. and I tried first year yes. to do three. Yes. You can't. It's literally impossible it's because it, you can get through maybe, but all three suffer yeah. if you try to do all three. Yes. Right? Yes. You can excel for sure at one, maybe two. Yes. You can't do, all, you can't do right. well if you're trying to balance all three. Impossible. Right? Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So if you're if you're so if you're if you're playing, and this is something that you really want to do, that this has to be a big focus. Mm-hmm. And now maybe a parent might sit there and say, "Well, you no, know, school's more important." And that's and that's I don't argue with that. But as a human being, if this is something that you want to do, no one is going to understand you, and you still can go to school and you can still do well, but you're going to sacrifice on the social side, and it's okay. Mm-hmm. But you're going to eat, sleep, and and train, and and in your school, I would argue. If you do well at it, it's going to actually benefit your hockey because it sharpens you up there. Mm-hmm. Um, but everything you do is like, like, what's my week look? I, mean, I talked to you about Charlie putting a journal. He saw us with our journals all the time, and he uses it, writes down what he does. That's a that's a tool, man. That's a weapon. Yeah. So now he looks at his week and he goes, okay, so it's Sunday, and my girlfriend wants to do something, but I can't really do anything until this day. So now he he takes time for her, which is good. Like, not that they're not getting married guys yeah <laughs> but they but he has a girlfriend you know, and she's a great girl so and i enjoy that she's around and she she gives him shit all the time mm-hmm. charlie you need to pick that up and he's like yeah yeah it's great she's good yeah. um so anyways but his week has to look like okay i've got this this week this week and then you know he talks to you about eating and he talks to dalton about training and he talks to um other people about other things and and, and it dials him in yeah. everything everything is about becoming the best hockey player he can yeah I've- prepared well, the, the, and the thing that I'm going to end off on yep. is the way that you're going to do this, the way that you're going to get yourself prepared in whatever the domain is, because to everyone knows what, what you need to do to get prepared. Especially if you're a kid, you know, you know what you need to do. You got to work out. You got to eat right. You got to yep. practice. You, you have to have yep. time for all these things. We've touched on that a lot in other, in other episodes. But the thing that's going to actually make you prepared is being radically honest with yourself about mm. your time. Mm. That is, that's the action step that you can take from this. If you're radically honest with yourself about what you're doing with your time, 
then you will be able to block those pieces in to get yourself ready for whatever the opportunities are. And that that could be like I just we just said, and player, parent, coach, whatever you're trying to improve, if it's your job, if it's hockey, if it's whatever, actually being honest with the division of your time throughout the day is what's going to allow you that, right? And I if agree. you can't, if you don't, if you miss that, if you're not being honest with yourself, and I used to get in battles with uh, my brother about this a lot too, because he would, he was a guy that would say this, oh, I like no choice, have to stay up late, like too much information, whatever. And maybe sometimes that was true, but the, for, for the majority of the time, it's not. If you, yeah. if you get your, your stuff in order and you figure out what am I doing with my time on the, on the hourly basis, you can fill that in and you'll get prepared because now you know where you can put these things, right? But yeah. that, that's what it takes. That's what yeah. you have to do. You have to be that honest. And if you don't, then you're going to be missing the boat and a yeah. lot of stuff, right? So Yeah, you want to be, be able in any situation. Did you work on your defensive game? Did you work on your offense? Have you shot the pucks from every angle, from every opportunity that you could? And, and if you've done all those things, when coach at a whatever level you're playing at, if you've never penalty killed before and he says, give it a shot, kid, that might be your opportunity. Mm -hmm. If you just neglected that defensive role or you just kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm more of an offensive guy, then you, maybe your opportunity is gone. You want to yeah. prepare in every every little detail, uh, vice versa, right? You, you get your first chance on a power play. Did you pay attention in practice Yeah. to what the power play yeah. actually is? Because a lot of guys don't. Well, it's nope. not me. Well, they take so. a knee and play yep. pass on the other yep. end. Then yep. you get a chance. To, what do I do, coach? Well, come, come on, dude. Yep. Right. So it's just it's about – being ready, being yeah. chomping at the bit for your opportunity because opportunity will come if, if, like yeah. I said earlier, right? When luck happens when opportunity yeah. meets, or yeah. when uh, preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. I am carving every quote possible. <laughs> I, I haven't said one right. Well, 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 I ended on this one. The, the opportunity is going to come, and whether you're ready to recognize it and take advantage of it yeah. is going to be that's up to you, yeah. right? That's going to be up to you. Yeah. So yeah. we'll leave her there for next one. Okay. Good. Sweet. Awesome.